Welcome to another Signal Conversation. This is a special one for me, uh, my friend, my colleague and uh, investor, Fred Wilson, uh, joins us. Fred's been a venture capitalist for 35 years, and he is currently a partner uh, and a co-founder of Union Square Ventures. Previously, he founded Flatiron Partners. He hails from MIT, where he has a Bachelor in Mechanical Engineering and then also has an MBA from Wharton. And he lives in New York City, where he's chair of the New York City Department of Education CS for All Capital Campaign and co-chair of Tech NYC. But more importantly, Fred is the most decent, forward-looking, forward-thinking venture capitalist in the business. And he has an uncanny eye for where the puck is going in both technology and consumer platforms. Fred was the first investor into companies like Twitter, Etsy, Coinbase, and the NFT platform Dapper, among countless others. His time and advice is invaluable. Entrepreneurs seek him out. Uh, it must be dozens or scores of them daily um, to seek his wisdom, as do investors and policymakers. And we're very fortunate to have him with us today. So thank you, Fred, for joining us. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure. So I want to start kind of broad and ask you, you know, thinking that our audience here are generally executives in larger uh, companies that are, um, you know, in more traditional markets. They may not even have a point of view on what the role of venture capital is in our economy. How do you answer that question? What's, what's the job that venture capital does? Our job is to support entrepreneurs um, at the earliest stages of their uh, company formation process. Uh, I think real venture capital is early stage venture capital. You know, this day, today, you know, it's much bigger industry than that. But I always think of venture capital as, you know, the first year or two of, of, of a company uh, being formed and providing capital to that. And then being an advisor, board member, uh, confidant uh, of those founders and the management teams that they create over, you know, five to 10 year period, generally speaking. So our role is um, to really support entrepreneurship in, in, in the innovation economy. And uh, if we do it well, then, you know, we're rewarded with financial returns. Um, but I really think that entrepreneurs are our customer and and helping them succeed is the role that we're supposed to play in the world. And your firm in particular has uh, is driven by uh, what is now well known in the industry. But but, you know, early on, you guys helped sort of coin this term. You're driven by an investment thesis or uh, several investment theses. Um, what is the investment thesis? What's yours current your current investment thesis? We're looking to uh, continue to back founders and, and companies that are using um, the power of the internet, the power of large networks that get built on the internet uh, to provide uh, new services. And the verticals that we're most interested in and have been most interested in are financial services, education, and wellness. Um, but we, we do go out, be, a little more broadly than that, but th that's, those are sort of our core areas that we like to invest in. And you also have a new climate fund, don't you? We do. So that's a new thesis for us that we developed about two years ago. And, you know, we think that the climate crisis is going to require both um, adaptation. Society is going to have to adapt to living on a warmer planet and also mitigation, uh, trying to reduce the amount of warming um, as much as we possibly can. And so our thesis there is to invest in companies that are either working on the adaptation uh, dimension or the mitigation dimension. Are you, uh, you know, encouraged by what you're finding in those markets as it relates to innovative startups who might be able to help us with the sustainability crisis? Yes, for sure. You know, the last two years as we've been deploying our first climate fund has been a real education for me. One of the great things about venture capital is that we get to meet with scientists and, and entrepreneurs and, and tech technologists and, and we learn a lot. <laughs> it's great. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like going to school every day. Um, right. And I'm pretty convinced that 
society has all the tools that we would need today to uh, ultimately mitigate, certainly adapt to, but ultimately, ultimately mitigate the climate crisis. And it's really just a function of our collective will to do it. Um, and that, of course, is hard because, you know, this, it's one of these problems that is years out. And so when people don't feel the, the urgency, they don't make changes to, to attack the problem. And so really what I think the, look, we're, we're investing aggressively in the sector and many others are too. So uh, I do think that lots of innovation is, is, has already come to market and will continue to come to market in and around climate, but it would be better if society had more urgency and more will to attack the problem. And of course, I think both of those are increasing at a pretty good clip right now, but we need a lot more, obviously. Right. Now, you were really early to the crypto space. As a matter of fact, I credit you for sort of turning me on to crypto because I've always followed uh, your uh, blog. And I would suggest anyone watching this go to abc.com, Fred's blog, which Fred was, is sort of the OG of the venture capitalist who writes out loud, thinks out loud on, on his own site. Um, but you were very early to crypto space and uh, it has seen a renaissance in the past couple of years. And you've been right in the center of it with many of your new investments. Um, you know, tell us your origin story. How did you come to crypto? Why did you think it was important? Why did you invest early? For me, it was really pattern recognition. When I first read the Bitcoin white paper back in 2011, I didn't fully understand it, um, but I was struck by how similar the architecture of Bitcoin and ultimately all the various Web3 assets um, are, is to uh, the orig original architecture of the internet. It was about a network that nobody would own, no company would own, no person, no company would own, that anybody could uh, effectively set up shop on. You know, back in, in the early days of the internet, it was anybody could connect a server to the internet and publish a web page and, and be in business. And with Bitcoin, it was anybody could mine Bitcoin and be a participant in uh, the growth of the Bitcoin network. And of course, that architecture has been adapted in, in many, many ways over the last decade or so. But the idea of this sort of permissionless network it's not controlled by any entity and, you know, anybody who wants to start a business could, could join and, and, and participate in the growth of that network just seems so familiar to me, John, you know, and of course, I think you would have recognized it too. Um, it wasn't like, yeah. it just, I happened to, you know, take the time to read the paper and think a little bit about it. Um, and, and I just, at that moment in time said, this is going to turn into something very important. Uh, and it's taken quite a while, frankly, uh, and we're not even all the way there yet. Uh, so, you know, it, new architectures and, and new ways of doing things uh, sometimes, you know, take quite a while for uh, to get adopted by society. And certainly that's been the case with crypto and Web3. But I do feel like we're getting a lot more momentum now and it's feeling more and more inevitable. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I think a lot of the folks in the audience may be scratching their head and even asking the question. So I'll ask you, how do you define Web3? What, what is this new architecture? What are its characteristics? I like to tell a story. Um, so lots of times I'll be in, on the board of a company and, and the board will say, you know, we need to get smarter about Web3 and they'll turn to me and say, Fred, explain Web3. And I always tell them this story because I think it's in many ways very enlightening. So I was the first investor in Twitter. And when we invested in Twitter, um, there wasn't really much to Twitter. There was a, a, a back end uh, and, uh, and a website that went down all the time. And so yeah. lots of people <laughs> built uh, mobile and web applications on top of Twitter that allowed anybody to use the Twitter backend. Um, and that was called the Twitter ecosystem. And it actually flourished for a number of years. And, um, and there were 
hundreds uh, of different Twitter clients and Twitter applications um, that were more popular than Twitter's own applications. And then there was a, an attack on Twitter where uh, an entrepreneur tried to acquire a lot of those third party applications and fork Twitter and, and take it over effectively. And the Twitter board reacted uh, very aggressively to that attack and locked down the Twitter API and removed people's ability to, to do that. Essentially, the Twitter said, well, we were open, but we, now we need to close it off, right? And build sort of more of a walled garden approach to, so we can protect our core business, right? Right. And that was a shame because a lot of the innovation um, evaporated and Twitter became, you know, um, you know, a, a siloed monopoly, just like Facebook and Google and Amazon and Apple and, and all the other big Web2 monopolies. Had there been an interesting that that happened right around the time that Satoshi wrote the Bitcoin white paper, roughly same time, 2009, 2008, 2010, somewhere in that in that time period, had Twitter been built as a Web3 protocol, mm -hmm. what what it would have done is it would have put its data assets on a public blockchain. So my tweets and your tweets would have been written to a public blockchain. There would have been a token like Bitcoin or Ethereum that would um, be issued to everybody who used it. And the Twitter company that built the, the Web3 version of Twitter would own a lot of those tokens. And the investors in that company would be rewarded not by revenues or profits, but by the ownership of those tokens. And uh, Twitter would then have been able to continue to allow this open ecosystem to flourish and would not have been concerned in any way by, um, you know, a fork or some sort of attack on the network because the network would have been open to anybody and, and the economic incentives would have been, you know, just aligned around the, the token as opposed to trying to execute a more traditional business model. And I realize that's a little abstract, but I think it's a very important story because that's what people are trying to build now in Web3. We don't yet have a Web3 version of Twitter, although I think we will someday. Um, but if you look at the architecture of the businesses that are built on Web3, they start with an open data, net, open data system. Data is written publicly to a blockchain. It's open source software, and anybody can build a business on top of these protocols and everybody's interests are aligned around a shared ownership of a token as opposed to, you know, needing to, you know, uh, control the network and control the business and extract profits in a more traditional way. So right. again, I think that's a little bit of ab abstract, but I think it gets to the core ethos of Web3 versus Web2. Yeah, and, and it's interesting how closely it mirrors, as you pointed out earlier, the original design of the internet itself. Open protocols, you know, uh, you know, data permissioning, but uh, public sort of RSS feeds, all, all this, all these original ideas of the internet that flourish, you know, until recently seem to be taking root again in this Web3 movement. Well, the thing that though the people who architected the original internet didn't know how to do because it was an unsolved computer science problem at the time was to share a database. Um, and that's right. really the problem Satoshi figured out with his consensus algorithm. So, so what Satoshi figured out was how to make a database operate in public and there's some consensus about which reads and which reads and writes are legitimate in which are not. That's the mining in the case of Bitcoin or proof of stake in, in terms of other um, blockchains. There's a consensus mechanism and a consensus algorithm that allows that to happen. Now, the problem with, with, block, with public blockchains um, is they're not as performant as you know, databases are. So um, we still have a lot of work to do to try to make public blockchains work at the kinds of transaction speeds that databases like SQL and MongoDB and other 
you know, uh, scaled Web2 databases uh, work at. And, and that's part of why I think, you know, we're not all the way there yet. Um, but I, I think that these are totally solvable problems. And there's lots of people who are working on solving them today. And I think I'm very confident that those will get solved. And then, and then we'll be in an era where, you know, the data is, the data on the internet is secured and shared in a way that um, it traditionally has not been. And um, right. new, bit, new models and new business architectures will emerge um, that I think will eventually replace these large siloed monopolies that we have today. That's a 10 to 20 year uh, thing, right? We're, I'm not yeah. suggesting to anybody here that they should go sell their Google stock or their Facebook stock or their Amazon stock just, just yet. But I do right. think that those large monopolies are ultimately at risk uh, to this new architecture. <laughs>